नमस्ते अली थैंक यू सो मच फॉर मेकिंग टाइम टू बी पार्ट ऑफ आर हिमसा कॉन्वर्सेशन and today the 17th of may i am even more indebted to you for making the time because of the terrible circumstances and the tragic violence that uh, your people and your neighbors in israel are having to deal with ordinary people uh, so i really really thank you in these circumstances for making the time for this conversation thank you for having me So, Ali, all Ahimsa conversations begin with one question: What is your earliest recollection from childhood of either the idea or the concept of or the experience of non-violence in any form? Well, it's not so different than what we're facing today. Even today, it's horrible. I mean, the militant level of the conflict is so high. When I was a child, you know, I experienced uh, the first uh, Intifada, 1987. I was 15 years old. But before that, I was born to a refugee family from 1948 to a very political mother who has been one of the leaders of PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization. So I encountered the conflict. Uh, from very very close you know eye and soul and body uh, i remember when my mother was arrested in 1982 i was 10 years old and for the sudden like another new identity has been opened to me which is the revolutionary identity uprising against the occupation from a very personal point as a child who wanted uh, not exactly revenge who wanted justice let me put it this way and uh, my mother was not a thief she's not a criminal who on earth has the right to arrest her and for my daily life conditions which is not better than many kids around the world for us palestinian growing up without an identity growing up without rights rights of studying rights of education right of uh, playing and even dreaming you know you ask yourself why do i came to this life no one recognize me and even facing a threat of the system of the occupation um i flew with my mind to start dreaming about crazy things like being a pilot but you know palestinians are not allowed to be pilots and even that days it's worse uh, and then you live you live this this life as part of the struggle and suddenly i am the son of the hero so i have to act in a very responsible way every single word can, could could charge a high price on the other hand i wanted to do my silly things as as a child but i couldn't even you know even reaching school sometimes was impossible and if we manage that then you go back home sometimes with no school bag tears in in in, in your eyes because of tear gas demonstration army everywhere settlers attacks and wherever there is a checkpoint you never know what's going to happen with you and what's going to happen to you especially when my mother was with me because she was a target and that was clear so uh, 1987 was for me the place where i start my political activities against the israeli occupation and then uh, you know i was how arrested. old were you ali in 19 at that time you were how old 15 i was 15 years old okay So uh, in 1990 I was arrested for the first time by the Israeli army with my mother. So finally I served 4 years in the Israeli prison with my mother who served 5 years. And for me going to prison was uh, you know was uh, the, the the break of my dreams, the break of my hopes. I didn't want to spend the best years of my life in prison. and what all what i did and all what i practice is 
my my cause of freedom all what i wanted so uh, palestinian political prisoners are the same kind you will see the top people inside prison professors lawyers so i found myself instead of being broken and you know knowing nothing how how people will treat me how prisoners will treat me i found myself going to some kind of one of the best universities that you can imagine so Because prisoners you, in, your fellow prisoners were such learned people exactly they created this whole system to manage and deal with 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 prisonment and system was based on five committees hmm. that you have to respect and to be part of committee of education management security national committee to organize relation between political parties but also negotiation committee with the israeli jailers yeah. you have to wake up in the morning uh, to do sport to sit twice a day in a circle there was a list of books you have to uh, study and prisoners will exam you there was a punishment committee no one were allowed you know to hurt anyone you have to respect everyone everyone should respect you it 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 left so much influence also on the jailers themselves and, interesting uh, and uh, actually my 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 first lesson with non violence was in prison when when i wanted to visit my mother in her other prison as i refused for three years then we decided to go for a hunger strike yes both you for and seven, your mother right yes 17 days of starving and after 17 days of that really hard struggle we managed to meet and i remember coming back to prison so proud of myself of my mother but something inside me has changed suddenly this young man who thought that israel understand just violence there is a new option in life to achieve freedom and the best weapon that i have never used before and even i discovered through that hunger strike that i was blind to is my humanity so i start learning about mahatma gandhi about martin luther king about mandela who's my biggest inspiration and You know, and you were, able, you were able to find books about all of them in the prison. Yes, because of these hunger strikes, where we where we were able to force Israel to provide us with books. I mean, not every book, but we were strong enough to guarantee some good books for our education. Then you know, Oslo Peace Initiative came. I was released to become part of the Palestinian Authority. so i'm not exactly practicing uh the fighting identity i'm practicing now an identity that should build a state with all the constitutions hoping that in 5 years from 1994 to achieve independent state living side by side with the state of israel but with my sorrow this is didn't happen because of the continuation of the military occupation on the ground because of the political palestinian failure and because of the uh, intervening and international invest investment in our conflict not in our solution because there are some parties who are not willing to see peace in this land and because of lack of engagement of civil society in in what is written on papers yeah so yeah so, so Ali this is maybe the good point to raise a question that uh, many people ask me as an advocate of nonviolence many people challenge me by saying how can violence which is a physical force be resisted by nonviolence which is a moral force so how do you respond to this actually it can be resist- resisted because violence is physical If, if violence was not physical it cannot be res- resisted you you don't attack the people you attack the system you attack you target the system that uh, 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 invest through people physically against other people so we you we you don't target physically because in war yes you can and for sure 
it's a proof that some wars uh, put an end to conflict. But just imagine that in this land where both identities and people believe 100% that this land is theirs, just imagine if we go for a physical solution by fighting. It means one of each side has to disappear, which will never happen. Or on the other hand, it will damage everything for any future. I don't want to live in a land that has no people or all of them are traumatized. I That's don't. Right. Land doesn't worth such yeah. a price. Yeah. Number three, listen, the issue of revenge, even after I lost my brother, he was killed by the Israeli army in 2000. I was wounded also by settlers. I paid high prices to go for physical legitimate action because people will tell you it's the freedom fight. It's moral, it's legitimate. Someone occupy your land, so you fight back. But things are not easy this way. Things are much complicated than that. On the other hand, what I want to say that the best revenge of the occupation is to celebrate our existence as victims, not to become victims of the system. By adopting nonviolence, my life has a meaning because I can easily revenge or kill someone or get killed. And that's it. This will be the end of the story. But I don't want my dream to end. I don't want my identity to be buried. And I don't want to be labeled as a terrorist. And finally, I don't want to kill people. I mean, I'm a human being. So I think it's not just us. I mean, people think that nonviolence, it's when you wear your humanity and fight, your nonviolence fight. I think it's also the opposite. My enemy humanity is my weapon. You have to be able by your act to bring your enemies to their own humanity. Maybe this is hard and for sure it's hard. Because weak people will use easy thing to fight, the physical act. But for me, I'm not fighting to win. It's not about winning on someone. Then I'm, str I'm struggling to live. Because you can win by dying. I don't want to die. I don't want people to lose their lives. I want to respect this land by practicing my relation to it in a fashion that I don't want to be a victim of anyone and I don't want to be a victimizer. This is the high level of nonviolence. And nonviolence is the best bridge to your freedom, to your rights. Because just there, during the process, you start practicing the dream and building a state. So it will not take us so much to heal after that because we already in the process. That's my hope. So uh, Ali, when did you find uh, found the Taghir movement? Because it is a movement uh, of grassroots community leaders who are committed to nonviolence. You have a Palestinian nonviolent charter. So can you say in detail how that came about and when and uh, how did you bring people together to agree to something like that? Honestly speaking, uh, since 2000 until 2016, I was uh, part of different joint initiative with Israelis. I joined the Parrot Circle Families Forum, the Bereaved Families Forum. I was the spokesperson of the organization. I launched different initiatives after that. I even founded a crazy initiative with Israeli settlers called Roots, who, who for me as a Palestinian settlers are the last people on earth that I should talk with. Then I realized that the problem is not within the peace movement itself. Part of it, yes because the peace movement itself is stuck. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll be honest and say that the peace movement, the joint peace movement has failed to recruit the majority of the people, especially Palestine, because the needs are different. Israelis will, will seek for a good Palestinian who doesn't want to harm Israel in any matter. 
Palestinians will seek for a process that will lead them to independence. So here we talk about nonviolent resistance, and there we talk about reconciliation. But we cannot reconcile. Reconciliation is a step in our process, but it doesn't start from reconciliation. So finally, 2016, I just had this dream, even before, to create a Palestinian independent nonviolence movement for two reasons. One is to guarantee nonviolent resistance to the occupation, but on the other hand, to take responsibility about things that occupation has nothing to do with them. Self-responsibility toward our people, toward our society, toward the corruption that we are facing, toward lack of plan for our future. So I start acting or reaching out to community leaders who most of them were with me in prison. And you know, and being you know, a political prisoner, it gives you a high credit. And my family consider as heroes in the West Bank. So people listen to me, but also so they listen when it comes to strategy, to strategize your, your movement and to practice this hope. So I found it Tagheer for that and to deal with the confusion between two identities, the identity of fighting the occupier and the identity of citizenship that we are struggling and confused between us Palestinian, but also to remove this label from non-violence. The labels say, the normalization, the anti-normalization movement. Many Palestinians are afraid to be labeled as normalizers with the occupation before any peace solution. So they find in nonviolence the way to achieve normalization, but not to normalize the relation with the occupier. So, so it, it, it speaks about people, it speaks about women, like example. Women has many struggles, not just the political one, social one, cultural one, traditions, the manhood culture here. So in this movement, they find themselves as leaders, as partners with men. So it's not just a political act, it's an act that guarantees development even to culture and uh, traditions. So is this what you, the charter speaks of a non-violent identity. It speaks of the values of a non-violent identity. Is this what it means, what you have just said? Or is there yes. more to that? Yeah, definitely, because we identified with non-violence because this is who we are. It's not about what we are about. Mm. Non-violence is not a project. It's not an organization. It's not a non-profit. I always say nonviolence is like love. You can you cannot have a tactic love. You know, Gandhi uh, spoke about uh, Sayata Graha and Himsa together. It goes together. So uh, love is not a project. Yeah. <laughs> it's like something in your blood. Yeah. And this is who we are. We are nonviolence people. So this charter came to describe the values, but also it's a big call to everyone here and and uh, internationally. So what are we asking people to be part of? We Palestinian has to be clear. So for me, this is the first time that there is a movement or a body initiating a clear nonviolence charter. That's right. And is there a training uh, process? Uh, because uh, for example, in the American civil rights movement, uh, with James Lawson and Martin Luther King Jr., there was very rigorous training because their assumption was that you have to prepare yourself for nonviolent action. Uh, is that how you proceed or is it that everybody figures it out at their own level? Yeah, there are two kinds of training. There is training about uh, uh, nonviolence leadership that is with the core leaders on the ground, and we call them messengers of change, because we want Tahir change to have its own messenger on the ground. And there is the general social training, how to deal with dilemmas and how to deal with, like how to respond non-violently to a crisis. So, so we are based in around 19 communities. If you go to Tahir website, you will see a map that describe where we are and our groups. And each group has a leader who is a messenger of change 
and we go through training with them. Definitely nonviolence need training, but also nonviolence to, to be adopted deeply needs a lot of community uh, sharing and meeting and com community services. Because you cannot just educate people about nonviolence without changing the conditions on the ground. That has to come together. So when our especially young uh, people get trained nonviolently, we allow them to choose social uh, uh, actions, then we support them. So we become followers of them, not just leading them. Yeah. So it's a multidimensional kind of activity. But at this moment, when there is uh, such a escalation in the physical violence, even though it may not be in your specific communities, how do you all respond to that? What do you, because I'm sure that at a time like this, there are uh, many people who will say more bombing is the answer. Uh, so how do you all tackle that? And, and on the whole, I'm sure there are people around you who don't like what you do, who, who believe that uh, nonviolence will, uh, will not get Palestinians their rights and, and, and justice. So how do you cope with that? How do you, how do you respond to that? Actually, in every attack, especially in Gaza, people said, this is the only way. And every time we go to that and we have nothing come out, just broken hearts, more damage and more death. It's always a circle of violence because it creates endless revenge when it comes to people's life. That's number one. Number two, we don't argue what people think but we offer new alternatives. I am not sure that the, my people massively uh, in, in a united way could have ever ha uh, had a non-violence massive approach. And this is what we in Tahrir are uh, planning. We want to see 100,000 Palestinians in the street because these politicians, the occupation, leaders, fanatics, whatever you want to call them, will not stop with just good intention or nonviolence training. It has to guarantee an un a massive pressure on the ground that will bring or force political uh, uh, leadership to sit and come up with solution. Finally, I will say, uh, I, I, I never tell people you are wrong. It's it's uh, who, who am I to tell people if they are right or wrong? But we share with them what we are. And this has to come with a successful examples of nonviolence models. So we have so many models of success on the ground. Like example, this disputed village near Bethlehem who had no electricity, no medical care, no water. Just imagine people live these conditions in Palestine. And, and most of the Palestinians doesn't know even the name of the village, which is Jubbidi. They don't know it exists. So suddenly we jump there and we help providing clinic, we, uh, 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 aid, uh, nonviolence education by three women who took the lead in that village. And now the whole village is a nonviolence example for development and steadfast because it's next to a settlement. So, we speak about nonviolence, but we have never brought successful models on the ground to inspire people and to recruit people. Finally, listen, violence and war is an ugly game of politician. They are not gonna stop because they have their own initiative. The problem is, are they represent the majority or the minority? I think they represent the minority and the silent majority. So for me, as, as a non-violence leader, I want to target the active extreme majority by targeting or empowering the big silent majority. Because if the majority go peacefully, which is the humankind in a very strategic way, I think we're gonna make it. Otherwise, I promise you, both sides in this land, as we I wrote, and I just shared my statement today. Yes, I about saw that. What's going on? Yeah.
both sides will fight until the last drop of blood because this is the only place where we both belong or can exist. So you cannot solve it violently. It will never happen. Yeah. But Ali, the irony is that it is the politicians that control formal power. They control the militaries, they control the police, the missiles, the guns. And uh, it's an old question. You know, for example, Gandhi was often challenged by people that, oh, your nonviolence could only work against the British because they were more civilized, but it would have never worked against Hitler. So today, what are the challenges that the nonviolence movements are facing when faced with this huge thing called the nation state with its armies and its aggression? I what think do we the do? big... I think the big challenge is within the movement itself. It's okay. not with the opponent. Okay. Because you spoke about Hitler, you spoke about uh, the occupation, you spoke about the British, uh, other people will speak about Hamas, and you know, everyone will speak about whatever. But I think that nonviolence movement has to be strategic. We don't have a strategy. As a, as a general nonviolence movement and organization, we are divided. We have to be united. It's like we are practicing the same model of political parties. And we forget that nonviolence is not about one side. It's about all people coming as a force. Number three, we have all of kind of nonviolence. You will see nonviolence organizations who believe in uh, healing or dealing with trauma, and that's it. You will believe in uh, uh, non-violence activism against the occupation by throwing stones. And people are deeply believe that this is non-violence, which is not. On the other hand, a stone against 60 ton Merkava tank cannot be compared. But they for forget the, the, the roots of the philosophy of non-violence. Number three, I think uh, we don't have also uh, within the process or within the practice any political achievement, because this is important to keep the movement alive. You need sta small stations of success, like what, what Gandhi and others has achieved. Number four, I believe that we Palestinian has to speak to Israelis in a different way. Because until now, even though we are not equal, even though Israelis are occupying us, we need a specific language to target Jewish fear, like example. This fear has caused us a price of our dignity, a price of our humanity, a price of our life. We have to target the fear, not the people. So there are strategies that has to happen in this land for non-violence movement to succeed. And by the end, I will tell you something that will sound, I don't know how it will sound, there is enough humanity within the Jewish people for Palestinian nonviolence to succeed. So we're not dealing with Nazis here, okay? So, so you will see a great example of humanity. I'm not now, I'm not becoming the lawyer of Israelis, but I believe, and this is my experience, I promise you, I succeed to evacuate checkpoints just by conversations. So, so, so we need this. We need to rethink now and redesign our our engagement with nonviolence. That is so true, Ali. Last week I had a similar recording of an ahimsa conversation with Robbie, whom you know very well, and I was thinking actually, you know, just that it's twenty six years since the Parent Circle Family Forum came to into being, for it to simply persist and keep doing what it does. Isn't that a huge success? It is. I mean, I, I, was, I was sure that while I was with the organization, you could save people's life and you never know if you did or not, but I was sure that we were saving people's life. And for me, if these kind of people like Robbie, like myself, like my mother, who joined the Paris Circle, uh, in the beginning, if they are able with all the high price that they paid to stand together 
to change this madness, to end the occupation and to secure everyone so everyone can. So this is a miracle. Yeah. You know, Robbie said something very profound. I mean, she said many profound things, but the one that struck me because it has uh, implications for people across the world. She said sometimes people are afraid to let go of their sense of victimhood. What is that? What is your insight on that? Why do we tend, many people tend to cling to the sense of victimhood? How to overcome that? I think it depends also on their environment because letting go need, need healing. Reconciliation need conditions around the, the ground. But if you are a victim like Jewish people, victims of the Nazis, and then they find themselves also in a conflict. So victimhood has become an identity, whether to defend themselves or to accomplish, uh, execute for their acts against Palestinian and not to be blamed. Because how can you blame a victim? So the victim identity jump in the first place and also to, 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 uh, to forbid others to intervene. When like the international community want to take a serious stand, they will not dare to take it because of the Holocaust. These are the hidden issues behind the conflict. And for me as Palestinian, to let go means that I have to find this environment that I, uh, I will not leave this place now and I will be stopped by an 18 years soldier who will slap me on my face. So, or a mother who have lost a son then she go to an event for reconciliation. Then when she come back, the killer of her son still, you know, walking around her home and threatening the rest of her kids. So re reconciliation has to become part of a political agreement because individuals can reconcile. But here we need a national reconciliation. And this will not happen if we don't adopt nonviolence. So I always tell Palestinians, you know what? I'm not asking you to stop being angry because you cannot stop being angry. But I'm asking you to invest this anger in the right way. So don't create another grave for yourself to be buried because of your rightness. Do you want to be right or do you want to succeed? That's a big question. So that's why victims has, has to think about success. So nonviolence is the only collective place that can bring them together to feel strong as one national body. That's my, that's my opinion. And finally, you know, to release ourselves from victimhood, sometimes people need justice. But I'm not stuck there because uh, I don't believe in justice. I believe in fair solution. And I'll tell you why. There is no just solution. There is justice, but there is no just solution. Because if you ask me, what will be the just solution for me who have become a, a refugee, who have lost my brother? What is justice for me is to have him back. What is justice for Robbie is to have David back, his, her son. That's justice. But then does that mean there is no justice and life is just hell? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying what Malcolm X said. He said justice is just us. So I'm not expecting anyone to give me justice. I have to be just to myself by not being the victim that the victimizers wanted me to be. That's what I meant. That's amazing. I see now that, and this is very powerful, and I think we can apply it in many situations here in India also, that the nonviolent identity in the way that you are defining it is a counter narrative to the victim identity. It's, 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 it's that, uh, that Iceland in the ocean that you cannot stay there and you cannot also stay in the ocean. You have to be between two. Yeah, yeah. So, Ali, uh, back a little bit to the nation state question that uh, somebody needs to also confront the business of armaments, right? One, we know that a large part of why conflicts persist in this world is because there are very powerful vested interests 
that want to have certain flashpoints and conflag permanent conflagrations so that all kinds of military equipment is constantly uh, having a market. So how uh, do you, are there any groups that are also confronting that dimension? Because I, I understand that the, a group that is working at the community level need not have to do that. But do you know of groups that are confronting that dimension? I think in nonviolence, massive or grassroots movement, you need also other groups on the political level or even other politicians. This is what we do in Tahrir in the security level. Even now, recently, in the Israeli side, we are trying to reach through the uh, charter that you just, uh, uh, we just spoke about. Uh, I think, yes, nonviolence approach has also to guarantee some kind of political action toward militarism, because the idea of, of, of militant action, it's military is an idea. Okay, so to, to deal with that, you have to understand that idea. What can feed this militarism issue and how can you really take that food out of it so it's not workable anymore? So you need voices within the system, the system of your oppressor and your own system. Voices that will also, you need lawyers like example, you need the international law, you need media, journalists, you need, it's a whole a lot of work that has to be done to go to each level, as you mentioned, and to, if I understood your question, and to deal with that. So, Ali, in closing, I just wanted you to share for people anywhere in the world, any, you know, young people, whatever their specific situation may be, what would you say to them who want to be working towards nonviolence, but they don't know what strengths they should build within themselves. You know, they feel confused and uh, they look for guidance. Okay, bhai, you know, how can, what should I do? What disciplines should I cultivate so that I can walk this way? So, yeah, this is a demonstration in the streets. Maybe we'll just wait. Okay, they are done. Okay, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we're in the middle of the fire, you know. So, okay. anyways, you know, I, I, I wanna, I wanna tell, uh, especially young people, that don't be stuck in the past because you are not responsible about it. You are responsible about the future. So focus in the future. Don't be stuck as victims or others who try to get you to this darkness. Number two, the, the big fight is the fight against yourself because you can fight others easily. But nonviolence will not happen until you start fighting your own anger, your own, you know, uh, hatred, because this is the biggest resource for your oppressor when you give him this gift of anger and hate, or even violence, that's a big gift. Number three, uh, there is no one uh, like 100%. Uh, don't look at us or to, you know, there are so many. <laughs> now there are some music, which is good. One sec, one sec, let them, let them finish. <laughs> Is somebody singing a song? <laughs> Palestinians are crazy, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, some we... music and some statements. And... Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So, so you were saying. Uh, the third thing is, so don't look to these big figures in nonviolence and tell yourself, you know, I will never be like them. It's not about them. It's about you. I mean, everyone has his own resource of humanity. I didn't learn nonviolence in the university at Con Conflict Resolution College. I just found it inside myself and I'm still learning. I'm still learning from every human being. On the other hand, 
maybe, maybe if we adopt nonviolence, we will not see solution in our life as we want. But the big winning is to practice who we are in a fashion of dignity that nonviolence guarantee. Nonviolence always guarantee dignity. And finally, I will tell the whole world as a Palestinian, it's easy to take sides, whether you are pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. Choose the side of solution. Doesn't mean that we are equal. Doesn't mean that we and Israelis have same conditions. No, ending the occupation is being pro-Israel actually, not pro-Palestine. Stopping violence is being pro-Palestinian, not pro-Israel. So we want this effective pro, and we always welcome you to take part of the solution wherever you are, because if you are not part of this problem, you can be a big resource of the solution. And I wish to you, uh, Ragni, first, and to the all Indian nation, safety, and may God bless you through this darkness that you are facing. Thank you. We need, we need all the blessings we can get but things are going they are getting a little better so now we feel maybe we can see the light at the end of the tunnel inshallah thank you so much ali god bless thank you,